Well, good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you all. Um, thank you once again for the invitation to come and uh, share with you again today. It's good to come and see you and to, to bring God's word uh, this morning. Uh, I do bring the, the greetings of my home church in Andover, Koinonia Independent Evangelical Church. Um, they, they'll be uh, uh, just rem- remembering us as uh, in their service this morning. So uh, it's great that we can we can come and uh, and uh, meet as a fellowship of God's people, even though we're perhaps not. I'm not here regularly. It's great to be part of the family here at Whitchurch Baptist Church as well. So thank you very much for for having us today. Uh, <clears throat> so this morning we're going to be looking at this passage um, from. 1 Peter chapter 2, um, and it's, uh, as I'm sure you know already, this is uh, a, a letter written by the Apostle Peter. He was uh, writing it from a place, he says, is Babylon, um, which almost certainly was a code word for, for Rome. Um, he was probably in Rome, round about AD 63-64. Most scholars think it was round about AD 64, uh, just about the time Nero was in charge and about to burn Rome down and blame the Christians. This is just before that persecution of the Christians began. And the purpose of this letter, really, is to prepare the believers for coming persecution. Peter wanted his readers to understand how they could live obedient and victorious lives, even under persecution. Uh, and in fact, Peter would teach uh, us, this, this is a great opportunity. Uh, the persecuted church has a great opportunity for evangelism in a hostile world. In chapter 1, Peter has reminded us of the salvation which we have been given in Christ and how that salvation ought to affect the way that we live. We're not, uh, we're not saved in a vacuum, we're saved for a purpose. And that purpose is to live and glorify the Lord, as we'll see uh, uh, this morning as well. So in this next section, in in chapter 2, verses 4 to 10, which we're looking at this morning, Peter encourages his readers by reminding them that they are not alone. Firstly, they are in Christ. And secondly, they are part of the church. You see, as believers, we're not individualistic. We certainly have an individual relationship and a personal relationship with Christ. But we're not supposed to be individualistic in our faith. Rather, we are part of one church, one body. And this same theme is taken up by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, where he reminds us that we are one body made up of many parts. But only as a whole do we fulfill the purpose that God has for us. So this passage this morning is about the church. It's jam-packed full of imagery, and we could spend probably hours uh, talking about it, but you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to spend hours talking about it this morning. I'm going to bring out a few points from this passage. Well, Peter reminds, begins by reminding us of our foundation. That is Jesus, the living stone. And this is a picture of God as our rock, if you like, um, as uh, the stone upon which we are built. It's something which echoes the Old Testament uh, in many, many ways. We read in Deuteronomy, for instance, chapter 32, verses 3 and 4. It says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. O praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. Paul in Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, sorry, chapter 10, uh, verse 4. Referring to the Israelites in the desert after the Exodus says, For they drunk from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. That rock was Christ. The idea of finding a refuge in in the rock was something King David was very familiar with. As he writes in Psalm 18, verse 2, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation through my, my stronghold. And Jesus, of course, himself referred to himself in very similar terms in Matthew 21 verse 42, where he quotes that same passage that Peter does uh, in verse 7 here from Psalm 118, applying that to to himself, that he is the stone the builders have rejected. And we'll come to that in a minute. So we come to Jesus. We come to Jesus, the living stone, the cornerstone, the foundation stone. And the fact that he is a living stone is, of course, uh, a, a contrast 
to the dead stones that made up the temple in the Old Testament. They weren't living stones. They, the, these stones that made up the temple were just pieces of stone, weren't they? And what does this show us? This shows us the superiority of the new covenant over the old. The Old Testament temple was always a picture of what was to come. It was a picture of, if you like, the church. It was a, uh, the, the physical was going to be surpassed by the spiritual. The physical nation of Israel, symbolised by this physical temple, would be surpassed by the spiritual nation that is the church. And this new temple, unlike the old one, was not made by hands of men out of dead stones, but is made by God with living stones, of which Christ is the first and the foundation, the most important. We saw in that little children's video there that the, the cornerstone was the, the first stone laid and it was the most important as it set everything else out. But he was rejected by men, as we'll see more of in a minute. He was chosen by God to be the rock upon God would build this church. And this metaphor is then extended to show how we fit in as believers. Because we also are living stones which make up this spiritual house. The foundation of the church is Christ. And it is rock solid. He is rock solid. It can never be moved. And it is on this foundation that God builds. And every believer is one of those living stones that make up this structure. And here we see a very powerful message that reminds us that we're not supposed to live our lives as Christians in isolation. We are part of something bigger than ourselves. Together we make up one building. We're not individual stones left lying around to do our own thing. We're put together to make up the one temple, the one spiritual building of God. God never intended us to be individualistic in our faith. We're part of a family. We're part of a group. And this is further emphasised when we get in a minute to verses 9 and 10. You know, if someone says they can live on their own as a Christian, they fail to understand God's purpose for them. Yes, it is possible to live on your own, and some people have that forced upon them by circumstances. Some Christians don't have uh, the, the, the luxury of other Christians surrounding them. And that's, that's not... That's not uh, the ideal situation. But in general, God has called us to live with others as part of the church, part of a local fellowship or church. And meeting with other believers where possible isn't simply a good idea. It's an essential part of the Christian life. It's important that we gather together because we are being built together into that one spiritual church. Now I realise that coming together with other believers isn't always easy. You know, sometimes there's a bit of friction. Sometimes people can be difficult. I'm sure nobody here is uh, like that whatsoever. But we are different people. We come from different backgrounds. We have different, uh, um, just different personalities. And that can cause friction. <clears throat> you know, I once built um, a wall in my garden. And uh, it, it wasn't the, the nice square bricks. It was all different shaped stones. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm doing this and I get the foundation down, which is was, was quite good. And I, then I put the first layer of stones down on, on this wall, which was, you know, it was okay. And then I start to put the second layer on top of that. And I start building stone upon stone and, and, it, and it, along it went. And um, it looked a little bit, uh, not quite right. Now I put the next layer on it. It was a bit, you know, it was a bit wobbly. It wasn't very good. And, and as I built it up, it got more and more unstable. Now you've probably noticed there was a problem with my building. I hadn't put any cement in between the stones. And of course, you know, these stones of all different shapes and sizes, and some were a bit rougher than others, they wouldn't fit together very well. They needed some cement between them. And that's what we need as Christians, as a church. And it is love, is the cement that binds us together. It overcomes those rough edges. You know, God is working on, he's, sh he's shaping us, he's making us a bit, bit better, but there's still those rough edges. And, and for us to come together as a church, 
We need the cement of love to bind us together. We need to have that, that love for one another because we're all different shapes with plenty of rough edges. But when we put that cement of love between us, we manage to fit together and we're built into a building which is strong. It is the building God is, is creating. You see, the church is not a bunch of individuals, but rather living stones being built into one building held together by God's love. We then have some further Old uh, Testament imagery. The temple was the place of sacrifices, wasn't it? Where the priests came and interceded on behalf of the people by bringing the sacrifices to God. Now in this living temple, we bring our own sacrifices. We are a holy priesthood. We offer spiritual sacrifices which are acceptable to God. The priests were the ones who, who came and uh, stood between man and God, if you like. They were the ones that were able to, to come and, and bring those sacrifices on behalf of the people. Uh, and that's what a priest was, somebody who stood between man and God. And the sacrifices that they brought, of course, were the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament. But now we're told we bring spiritual sacrifices. And we can read about what that is in, in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 where those living stones that are, are us become living sacrifices. We become the living sacrifices ourselves. Romans chapter, one, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says uh, that we are, we, we are the, the living sacrifices, holy and dedicated, pleasing to God, and that we don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but rather we, we serve and honour our Lord. That's the sacrifice that we bring ourselves dedicated to God's service and that is acceptable not because of who we are but because of who we trust in they're acceptable in Christ through Christ and it is only uh, through trusting in Jesus that we become acceptable to God we have no righteousness of our own we are given Christ's righteousness when we trust in him when we repent of our sin and put our faith in Jesus and it is that repentance and faith that brings us into the body of Christ, that brings us in to the church. Well, in this passage, Peter then goes on to give us three pictures of Christ from, Old Test from the Old Testament. First of all, a precious cornerstone from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. And we've mentioned this already. Jesus is the cornerstone, the foundation stone. Um, and... Uh, uh, this, as I said, would normally refer to this large stone placed in the corner of the foundation. But it can also mean the capstone. And again, we'll see this in the next, next verse. Uh, the stone that was placed at the top of the building to finally complete it, to hold it all together. And uh, it's, it's the capstone is the stone in the middle of an arch that uh, stops the arch from collapsing. It's the thing that holds everything together. So Jesus is both the cornerstone upon which we build, but he's also the capstone which holds us all together. He's the foundation and he is the completion. And that is, what, that, that is, that is who Jesus is in the church. And it says, those who trust in him will never be put to shame. In other words, our eternal welfare is secure. Nothing and no one can take us from the hand of Christ. And there's tremendous assurance in this, isn't there? Because true believers are safe for eternity. Those whom God has chosen, back to chapter 1, verse 2, those who are the elect, chapter 1, verse 1, can never be taken from God's hand because he has chosen us and he holds on to us. Our salvation does not depend on us holding on to God. It is about God holding on to us and his grip is secure and will never fail. If you walk along the road with a, a young child and they're holding your hand, their safety is not in the fact they've got hold of you, it's in the fact that you have got hold of them. And that's like us with God. We often think we're holding on to God, but actually we're not. God is holding on to us and he is secure and his grip will never fail. So Jesus is the rock upon which we stand, upon which the church is built. And we're told, aren't we, even the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. That's how secure we are. 
Next, we read that he is a rejected stone from Psalm 118, verse 22. And again, we've already seen that Jesus has quoted this about himself. He was rejected, but he has become the capstone, the one that holds all things together. Who rejected him? The builders rejected him. I don't know if you've ever seen builders at work. You're quite clever if you catch them doing some, I think, sometimes. But if you've ever seen builders at work, it's actually a skilled job, isn't it? And it requires the best materials to be used for the correct purpose. I, I saw um, a programme of, of somebody building a dry stone wall once. And it was very skilled the way they do it. They, they select certain stones to be at the bottom as the foundation. And then, then they gradually build it up and, and they fit all these different shapes together. Without cement in this instance, but that's a different illustration. Um, <clears throat> but it's a very skilled job to do this, to get the right stones in the right place to build that wall. And a good, skilled builder recognises the best stones to lay. The best stones to lay in the right places. The best stones to lay as a foundation. The right one that's going to be used to, to hold it all together. Well, the builders here, as, uh, some tell us, got it wrong. They rejected the best stone. Now, I guess this could refer to anybody who rejects Jesus. But I think it's primarily referring back to the children of Israel. And in particular, to their religious leaders. These are the people who should have been building the people spiritually by correctly interpreting the Old Testament scriptures, correctly interpreting about the Messiah and salvation. But they failed to recognise who Jesus was. They failed to realise he is this foundational stone and they rejected him. They threw him away. Rather than welcome him for who he was, they uh, rejected him and had him crucified. This stone, thrown away by those who should have known better, has the place of honour in this spiritual building that God is building. Those who reject Jesus reject their only hope of being saved. Their only hope of being saved. Because there is no other name by which we must be saved. We read in Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Jesus himself claimed to be, didn't he, the only way to the Father in John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, one of the devil's cleverest lies, I think, is to, is to say to people, it doesn't matter which religion you follow, because they all come to God in the end. All roads lead to God. Well, there's a half-truth in that. All roads do lead to God, but most of them lead to his judgment seat. Only one road leads to salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus Christ can we be saved. And that's the message the church has. You know, it, it, some people think it sounds arrogant. Well, maybe it does sound arrogant, but this is the truth of the gospel. This is the truth of what Jesus himself says. This is the truth that God gives us. There is only one way to heaven, and that is through trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way to the Father. The stone that the builders have rejected is the most important stone in this building that God is building. Third quote comes from Isaiah uh, chapter uh, 8 and verse 14. And again, this is a prophecy that uh, uh, the Messiah would cause people to stumble. <coughs> in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 23, Paul writes, writes this. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. The message that Jesus brings uh, was one that trips up many people. It became a stumbling block to the Jewish people. In human terms, just think about it. The idea of putting your faith in a man that was put to death as a criminal seems quite preposterous. Especially that form of execution, which was crucifixion. I mean, that execution was re reserved for people of the worst type, the worst types of criminal, the lowest of the low. And the people who suffered uh, crucifixion as an execution were the dregs of society, the murders, the rapists, the child molesters, etc. 
And actually, both Jews and Greeks regarded anyone who hung upon a tree to be cursed. Again, back to Deuteronomy 21. If a man guilty of a capital offence is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him in the same, on the same day. Because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. It was inconceivable to the Jewish people that any reputable person, let alone their own Messiah, could die upon a cross. It was unthinkable that anyone claiming to be the saviour of the world could possibly die in this fashion, let alone claim it as a triumph. Just suppose for a minute, you know, uh, that God had asked you to come up with a plan of salvation. How would you have done it? I kind of suspect that after a lot of thinking, we might have come up with something a little bit different. It probably wouldn't have been um, a really grand plan, but I doubt any of us would have chosen to do it the way God did. It doesn't seem very logical, does it, to have somebody killed to be a saviour? But you see, it's not possible to understand the message of the cross and what that really means unless you come to some spiritual understanding, unless you've been enlightened by the Holy Spirit to bring you to that place of spiritual understanding. We need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the truth of the gospel. Otherwise, it remains foolishness to us. There was some well-known graffiti on a wall in Rome, which is now in the Palatine Museum in Rome, that shows a worshipper standing before a crucified figure with the body of a man and the head of a donkey. And the caption underneath says, Alexamenos worships his God. Alexamenos worships his God. And uh, it was thought this was just some graffiti that was aimed at uh, mocking this Christian named Alexamenos. And it clearly shows how the supposedly wise people of this world regard the message of the cross. It's foolishness. It's a stumbling block. They fail to believe and they fail to obey the message to repent. That's what we read read here. They fail to do what God has called them to do because they fail to see the, the, the truth within this gospel message. But then we get this contrast in this passage here. When Peter writes, but you but you, a chosen people. True believers are a chosen people. Chosen by God before the foundation of the world, before time itself began. Chosen to be living stones built into a living temple that is the church. And Peter now emphasises the church and its role. He says, you're a royal priesthood, As we've seen, the Old Testament priests were those who interceded with God on behalf of the people. Well, the church is a royal priesthood. Not just a priesthood, a royal priesthood, because we belong to the king. The king of kings and lord of lords. We no longer need priests to intercede on our behalf, because we have direct access to God. We fulfil that priestly function ourselves. We come directly to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God. Note as well, Christians are never individually referred to as priests. We are referred to as part of the priesthood, part of the body, part of the church. And again, that's another emphasis on the fact that we're not individualistic in our faith. We must be part of the wider body. We are drawn together. It's another emphasis on the importance of the church. And again, that's stressed by the next phrase, a holy nation. The physical nation of Israel has been superseded by the spiritual nation of the church. That was always God's plan. Right back to Abraham, he said, many, you, you are a blessing to many nations, not just to the one nation of Israel. You will be a blessing to many nations. Your descendants will come from many nations. And, and, then, and when Jesus came, he's brought that, that Gentile, the Gentile nations into the kingdom of God, into the church, into the spiritual nation of Israel. Paul in Romans writes, not all Israel is Israel. What does he mean by that? He means 
that not all the spiritual nation of Israel comes from the physical nation of Israel. It comes now from outside that physical nation. We are being built together as a body of people and made into a holy nation. <clears throat> Holiness, I'm sure you know. To be holy means to be set apart, to be different. God sets us apart. We are to be set apart from the rest of the world. We are a holy nation, one which is different to those around us. The nation of Israel in the Old Testament was supposed to be different to the other nations. They were to be dedicated to God. They were to be separate from other nations who worshipped false gods and followed idols. But they failed time after time to do this, didn't they? And all too often they turned away from God and fell into the worship of those idols and those false gods. This spiritual nation to which those in Christ now belong is holy because Christ is holy. Because we have his holiness, his righteousness given to us. We are righteous because Christ is righteous, not because we are righteous. And we belong to God. We are no longer our own masters. Not that we've ever been our own masters. We're either slaves to sin or slaves to God. But people think they're their own masters, don't they? But they're not. But when we become Christians, when we repent and put our faith in Jesus, we then become slaves to God. We belong to him. We're here to do his bidding, his will, to serve him, to do everything we can to do what he calls us to do, to be obedient to what we read in Scripture. And what's the result? The result is we declare the praises of him who called us. The final part of this passage this morning. The purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to bring glory to God. That's the purpose of the church. I mean, we have other purposes. We have to go out and, of course, to... to take the gospel to the nations around us. But the primary purpose of the church is to bring glory to God. We are to, uh, to, to bring that glory to the one who has called us. He has brought us from darkness, Peter tells us, into his wonderful light. He's taken people from every tribe and tongue and nation and he has made them into the one building, the people, the church. He's shown us his mercy. And the result is, we glorify him. The church in this world, of which you are part, if you've put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the church in this world is to glorify God. And we do that in many ways. Taking the gospel out. Sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We glorify God. That is our purpose. Now, if you belong to Jesus this morning... You are the church. Now you may be a, a local church, but you're part of the wider church. And there is only one church. There is only one church, the church of God. And God tells us you will never be put to shame. If you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you will stand strong because he has hold of you. You belong to a royal priesthood. You belong to a holy nation. You are the people of God. I want to close this morning with a, a quote from Mr. Spurgeon. And he says this, There are, in truth, but two denominations upon this earth, the church and the world. And that's it. You're either in one or you're in the other. You're either in the church the one true church of Jesus Christ, or you are in the world. And sadly, many people who think they're in the church are still in the world. But those who genuinely belong to Christ belong to that living temple. They belong to God. Let me ask you this morning, which one do you belong to? Are you in the one true church? Or are you still in the world? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this lovely passage. And there's, Lord, there's, there's so much more in it that perhaps we could have spoken of this morning. But we pray that as we just thought of these few things, that, Father, you may have been talking to us through your Holy Spirit, that you may have been impressing upon our minds the things you want us to know. 
Lord, we don't want just to hear the words of a man. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear what you would say to us. And we pray that as we meditate upon these things, as we meditate upon who Christ is and what he has done for us, um, we just pray, Father, that you would speak to us by your spirit. And we also pray, Lord, that as uh, we are being built into that one true church, as we are individual living stones, but part of a bigger family, we pray that we might glorify you in all that we do. So bless us, encourage us, and help us to understand more of what you say to us. Through your word we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching with Church Baptist Church YouTube. If you're new to our channel, why not subscribe? That way you can know when we post new content. Make sure you leave us a comment. Let us know how we can pray for you, what spoke to you today, and where you're writing from. And also share these messages with one of your friends if you find them encouraging and inspiring in any way. Hey, listen, if you're able to, why not join us in one of our services at our physical location? All our details are on the website. I'll see you there. God bless you.